The governing body for lawyers in this province, soon to be renamed the Law Society of Ontario, recently adopted an action plan aimed at combating racism and improving diversity in the profession. It hasn't exactly been smooth sailing, and one part of the Law Society's plan is now the subject of a legal action itself. Joining us now for their views on the plan and the wider questions of diversity in the profession, let's welcome Catherine Hensel. She's a lawyer with Hensel Barristers. Rocco H. Ampong, a lawyer with Rocco K. H. Ampong Law Office. Royland Moria, a lawyer with Moria Law. Sadi Etamad, a lawyer with SET Law. And Julian Falconer, co-chair of the Law Society's Equity and Indigenous Affairs Committee. And it's a pleasure to have you august people here around our table here this evening for uh, a very timely discussion. And I want to start by putting up, Sheldon, if you would, this graphic, which we'll lay out uh, in cursory detail some of what the new rules state. Through a written statement of principles, all licensees must acknowledge their obligation to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion. Every firm with 10 or more licensees must implement a human rights and diversity policy addressing fair recruitment, retention, and advancement. That's what the Law Society of Upper Canada, as it is still known until the, launch, the name change rather comes in, uh, has as one of the key planks in its Working Together for Change platform. Julian Falconer, let's start with you. What led to this decision? What led to this decision was uh, really uh, an expression of concern, Steve, across the board uh, in terms of barriers being faced by our racialized licensees. I say licensees because the Law Society uh, 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 regulates both lawyers and paralegals. We conducted consultations between 2012 and 2016 extensively across the province, uh, organizations, individuals, and we spent time and we listened. And what we heard wasn't easy to hear. We heard that approximately 40% of racialized licensees identify uh, their race as a barrier in their work. Interestingly, 3% of non-racialized licensees see their race as a factor. We heard the same things you would have heard 10 and 20 years ago, meaning we simply haven't made progress around issues of systemic racism. And I don't think it's confined to the legal industry. I think as a society, we have a difficult issue to grapple with. Hence, it was time to actually take positive steps and to not talk in platitudes, not talk in hopes, not talk in apologies, but to take positive action, and that's what you're seeing. We have actually a few more numbers that we can share, one of which you just gave. So, Sheldon, let's put this up as well. Here's the lay of the legal land in the province of Ontario. There are 61,000 lawyers and paralegals licensed, licensees, by the Law Society. In 2015, 18.6% of lawyers identified as racialized. 26% of the province identifies that way. A survey from 2013 showed, as Julian just indicated, that 40% of racialized licensees said that their ethnic identity was a barrier to entry, and 43% said it was a barrier to advancement. Let us just off the top here establish, because you use the expression as well, racialized. We hear that a lot nowadays, and I'm not sure everybody understands it to mean the same thing. So just tell us what you mean it to mean. Well, the term is used, uh, and there's no precision to this. You know, I've got, uh, uh, sadly, I'm an old man. I've got 25 to 30 years in on human rights litigation, and the expressions change with the times. So the term racialized is actually used uh, academically as a term uh, by the Human Rights Commission and is defined. And it uh, quite clearly refers to those uh, folks who would fit in visible minority categories. Um, but I want to emphasize, it is about self-identification. So it's not about Big Brother uh, imposing a label. People self-identify according to our gathering of data. But at the end of the day, what it's really meant to do is identify those who would have the greatest vulnerability on issues around systemic racism, and that's who we're talking about. Let's get some reaction from around the table. First impressions of the attempt by the Law Society of Upper Canada, soon to be Law Society of Ontario, to do this. Sadi, what do you say? I, I was just surprised that I, by my background, fit into this category, but it is a self-identified category, and I probably have ticked the box of uh, Middle Eastern, let's say, in, when I was filling out my application to the Law Society, but just just being labeled as a racialized lawyer uh, or licensee, it's 
it's just putting me in another box. Do you consider yourself a racialized lawyer? When I hear the word racialized, I think I was disadvantaged. I mean, I hear that I was disadvantaged in some way, and that's why I'm fitting into this category, but I never in my life have felt racialized in the Canadian society. Even I lived in England, I didn't feel racialized by the British society. But apparently 40% of your colleagues do. So what do we do with that? Well, I think that's a bigger political problem of oversensitivity, political culture that there is. I, I don't know how my colleagues feel, but I have never, I, I think if I was racialized, I wouldn't have been a lawyer in Canada after 15 years of immigrating here. Okay, let's get so some more reaction. That, that, that's, I think. I gotcha. Royland, what do you say? Well, uh, I think that um, some of the numbers that uh, Julian has uh, spoken about uh, really reflect the difficulties that we have as a profession. Uh, and um, what's important uh, is that we are a self-governing profession uh, and um, we have an obligation to society at large. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to be able to uphold that obligation, particularly the confidence that's required uh, uh, within the system that we work, uh, the confidence that the public is going to have uh, about the legal system. I'm a criminal defense lawyer and we know that that's a real concern already, uh, that there's a significant concern about public confidence in the administration of justice. And when we have a situation where we are still dealing with uh, real concerns about discrimination, about racism, about uh, inclusion within that system, that significantly impacts the public confidence in the administration I of justice. I will ask you the same question that I asked Saadi. Do you consider yourself a quote-unquote racialized lawyer? I think that I am a racialized lawyer. If I was uh, told to self-identify as such, mm -hmm. yes, I would. Uh, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I was fortunate to be uh, brought here by my parents and to have many opportunities given to me that I would not have had. Uh, but I also appreciate that my reality uh, and the circumstances within which I uh, came to become a lawyer here in Ontario are different than other racialized groups. And so we have to appreciate that while we may self-identify and we may not necessarily feel that we have the same concerns as others, that there are others, and clearly there are others based on the numbers that we've heard, that do have issues. Let and me, we have to address those things. Let me confirm with you. Do you consider yourself part of the 40% of racialized licensees who say their ethnic identity was a barrier to entry in the profession? That's a difficult question because I, I think that one of the things that we do recognize now is that um, racism and discrimination are not necessarily always overt things. Uh, and what that means is, is that while looking back over the course of you know, my time, whether it would be in my undergrad uh, uh, years or whether it's in law school or, or whether it's uh, as, a, as a young lawyer sort of moving my way up through the process, there probably were times that it might have been, and there may have been times that I didn't even recognize that so it was. So it may have happened, right? you may not even have known it. May not even That's have known possible. it, okay. right? Catherine, let's get you in on this. Uh, your initial reaction to what the Law Society is attempting. I think it, unfortunately, is a, a necessary step. It shouldn't be necessary. Uh, we're already required not to discriminate. We're already required under the rules of professional conduct to do exactly what, what the, the statement uh, require, requires us to acknowledge. But what I see in the profession, what I see in the courts, what I see with my colleagues, and what I see in the legal profession's engagement with broader society uh, belies that, that obligation. What's it's that not a being met. To? Uh, what you see? I see uh, many, many or legal organizations and law firms um, in the upper ranks dominated by uh, for lack of a better term, non-racialized... Uh, Let me just say white men. White men. Yeah. Um, I see lawyers who work with their, their vulnerable clients or as opposing counsel uh, with... I'm, I'm Indigenous myself. Um, I have seen and heard uh, members of the professions say things, do things, with respect to me and my clients that were overtly discriminatory. Example, please. Um, questioning whether I'm a lawyer, suggesting that I am a token, that I'm not a competent litigator, uh, denigrating my client's uh, engagement with their culture and their, uh, their desire and their insistence to live as Indigenous people within their own territories. Like, open contempt for that, including on the record in court. When that happens, what do you do? I challenge it. Uh, I have at times been rendered speechless. Uh, 
there's a lack of appreciation often in the room amongst many of the legal players in the room about the significance of what's just occurred. Uh, that it's, it's considered fair game. Uh, it's an adversarial system. You take your, you take your shots where, you're, uh, where you can in order to be persuasive and advocate on behalf of your client. What this says, what this acknowledges, and it's a part of a broader regulatory uh, scheme that's got to move forward to change what Julian's like, correctly identified as a very stubborn problem in society and the, and the legal culture and profession, but to um, require lawyers to turn their minds to and acknowledge that that is actually not fair game. That is not a legitimate part of the, any legal process, and it's not open to us as legal professionals, as li licensees, to use that kind of tactic and espouse those type of views as, as part of the litigation or other legal processes. Gotcha. Rocco, we haven't heard from you yet. Let's hear from you on this. Your reaction to what the Law Society is attempting. Well, <clears throat> I was speaking with, well, I was asking Julian earlier as a <clears throat> vice chair of the working group. You can't disagree with what's being, what the Law Society is trying to accomplish here. I mean, no human being in your right mind in the modern day could say, I am opposed to promoting uh, anti-discrimination. Uh, anti I'm opposed to uh, not being racist. They're just, it's so not. in spirit, you're with them. Naturally, I, I, that's who I am as, as a black male in this, uh, in this society. What I asked Julian was, what does it mean to comply? What does it mean? Because I think what's contemplated in the years to come would be compliance audits. And what will be happening is the law society, by some criteria, will walk into a law firm and see whether or not you are complying with the spirit and letter of what is being suggested. Do you have a problem with that? I don't. But what is the basis of compliance? Does it mean then that I have to say, for example, uh, if you have, as Catherine has pointed out, a law firm where uh, it's majority white men, <clears throat> do I have to go out and seek a black man to be in compliance? Are we in a sense, legislating <clears throat> associations in, in that respect? Are, you that making, are we making employment decisions uh, in that respect? And I can see where constitutionally some would have a question about that as it has been challenged in, uh, by Professor Alfred, I, I believe, up north. The Law Society is well within its right. It's well within its authority uh, to legislate it. I think the Constitution contemplates it. Um, Section 15, subsection 2 of the Charter of Rights allows for uh, the Law Society to uh, institute programs if it deems it ameliorative uh, of conditions for historically disadvantaged peoples. And I don't think anyone would disagree that the history of relations between cultures in this country has had some groups suffer historical disadvantage. But so what we want to flesh out is, Particulars. It, it, it seems too vague. It, it, you read, for example, in your own guidelines, immediately, that it somehow undercuts the the potency of what they're trying to achieve. It says the requirement does not create any obligation to profess any belief or to seek or to persuade any anyone about anything. But that's precisely what we're trying to do. It says don't be racist. Right? And then you have, the requirement will be satisfied by licensees acknowledging your obligation to take reasonable steps to cease or avoid conduct that creates and or maintains barriers for racialized licensees or other equality seeking groups. Which I think flows from a recognition that the status quo as it currently is, is restrictive. It's limiting. Uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a reason why you find Royland and I as sole practitioners. Well, I was, gonna, have... I was going to ask that because you're, you two are sole practitioners. You two are not with what you'd call, what are they called, the Seven Sisters or something like that? The biggest. I, I used to be. But you I'm used to be. I'm a practitioner too. Yeah. You're a sole practitioner yeah. as well. I had, I had my own firm. Is that a coincidence? No. No. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. No, I think the Law Society has, has propounded on this uh, on a number of reports, saying, uh, and in, uh, a number of uh, fact finding studies have suggested that racial, quote unquote, racialized licenses, and I do, I do disagree with that term, racialized. Okay, you've raised a fascinating issue there about compliance, and I want to get Julian on that. Okay. If, if, for example, the future Law Society of Ontario deems a significant law firm in this province, uh, not to be in compliance with the spirit or the attempt of what you're trying to achieve here, what remedy do you see being applied? 
Well, first of all, let's be careful about what we're talking about. We're right now talking about the requirement of the statement of principles. There's other requirements that are going to kick in. There's 13 recommendations. There's uh, data collection in respect of uh, firms of 10 or more licensees. Then uh, inclusion uh, data that's going to have to be provided by firms of uh, 25 or more licensees. So there's, this is only the beginning in terms of proactive steps. And I want to be clear about that. And it's one of the reasons it's so important that this discussion happen now, so that it doesn't happen as we inch along. Uh, there was a decision of convocation, which is the group of the board of directors of the regulator to pass this entire package of reforms together. Uh, in that vein and in that spirit, like any other rule of the Law Society, ultimately there has to be a compliance plan, and there is. And to answer Rocco's question directly, uh, for the first two years, the emphasis will be on education. It will be on education and it will be on cautions in respect of those who uh, uh, aren't able to comply or are not complying. So just understanding how that works, somebody from the Law Society would go to firm X and say, you're not really in compliance right now, and what? And I want to emphasize what that looks like so that we're not artificial about this. Mm -hmm. What that looks like is this is combined with a, uh, a CPD requirement. CPD? Another, uh, professional development. So in other words, we also have a cultural competence requirement of training now that is going to be mandatory courses on issues around cultural competence. Mm -hmm. So this education emphasis is in the first two years because this is new, it's groundbreaking in terms of any other law society in the country, and so we're going to help our members, our licensees, understand what's expected of them. After two years, we will uh, uh, basically learn from the two-year experience and initiate what we call progressive compliance. So like any other rule at the law society, we're a regulator. I mean, progressive well, compliance means what? Progressive compliance means you go up the ladder, and when you go up the ladder, it starts with warnings, and if you're unable and remember, it's not about us checking out the contents of a statement of principles. There's a box required on your reports. Like other, you should know, there's a whole series of declarations you have to make as a lawyer, starting, by the way, with the oath to the queen. Just saying, it's very interesting that the detractors and objectors today are not present at the calls to the bar saying that there's something wrong with declaring your oath to the queen. I mean, if you want to talk belief system, I can't think of something more fundamental. We're talking here about conduct. In other words, and, and I want to be clear, I may have personal views um, about how I would like people's beliefs to play out, but they have nothing to do with conduct. We have one role as a regulator, to regulate the conduct of barristers and solicitors and paralegals. And Rocco, to answer your question, it isn't about beliefs, and it's on purpose not about beliefs, it's about conduct, behavior. If you look up the word principle in the dictionary, it says beliefs or behavior. We're focused on behavior. So in the workplace, your behavior can be a barrier to racialized licensees. And the answer is, we're here to regulate it. Well, no, I, I don't think, I hope uh, Julian's not misapprehending what I'm saying. I didn't even touch on belief. And I, I certainly have no issue with taking an oath to the sovereign. The issue is, you say, <clears throat> I don't. You and say, I'm gonna follow up. You yeah. say, you will walk into a law firm <clears throat> and it begins and climbs up the ladder, it begins with a warning. What is the basis that will lead to that warning? A is it mandatory requirement for a statement of principles? So there's a box, not, not dissimilar to the real estate requirement. You have to have informed yourself about realities of mortgage fraud and then gone further with the Terra requirement uh, as it relates to real estate. What I'm trying to say is there's a box you have to tick to say you've done it. If you don't tick the box or you actually say... And you also don't have to make it public. Say, let me just that's jump That's true. That's you true. also don't have to make it public. That's right. There is no... Even though there is a requirement for you to promote it, you don't have to make it public. Should it's we have to? I'm, I'm reminded of... An, uh, uh, and I'll just uh, uh, hasten to just offer this quickly. Of that 1970s, 1980s uh, uh, television show, Yes, Minister. <laughs> right, and you have Humphrey Appleby and all the permanent secretaries across uh, the table, around the table, and it was an issue on positive discrimination, increasing the role, uh, the presence of women in the permanent secretary uh, class of the British Civil Service, and obviously all these Oxbridge educated permanent secretaries closed off, by the way, to LSE graduates and University of Access graduates <laughs> and all the, all the other so-called inferior universities, and they all said, "Well, uh, we don't." disagree with it in principle, right? We agree with it in principle, but there'll be uh, practical problems with implementation in my, in my department. But yes, 
we can all sign a document basically saying we agree with it. And is that what the law society is basically saying? Then it, it starts to look like a bureaucratic gloss. I want meat on, I want meat on the bones. That's all I'm asking. Unless so, let's get, hang on, we got 12 recommendations. I just want to be clear. There's 12 more recommendations that make it clear there's meat on the bones. I mean, we're getting criticized for being too regulatory about race. You're criticizing us for not being regulatory enough. That's the essence of get discussions in Canada. I don't think that's what we're saying. We're just saying there's an inherent conflict in what the law society is trying to say and portray about this. If this is just a tick in the box and it's something cosmetic, then it's not going to achieve its goals. But if it's, this is a substantive thing and this is going to be a regime change, then it is something substantive and it is kind of politicization of our bar towards a greater, higher principle that we all hold in our society, diversity. But it's, we're not saying that the principle is wrong. We're just saying that tell us whether this is just a tick in the box or this is a chain, regime change. Let me follow up on that with, with Catherine mm -hmm. because I want to know how you became a lawyer given that you had to swear fealty to the Crown, I, which as an Indigenous person, I can't imagine you wanted to have done that. I didn't, and we didn't. Uh, we don't, we're not required to anymore. Uh, w lawyers were for many years. Most lawyers do. Uh, but you're not required to stand and do it. And you're, you're correct uh, for, for a variety of reasons that would be uh, a significant barrier to me in the profession. But it bespeaks what uh, Saudi was describing as the, um, the politicization of the bar. It's already deeply, deeply politicized. Oath to the Queen. Um, all the principles that we are required to uphold as lawyers are deeply embedded in primarily Anglo, white, British culture in Canada, as it manifests itself in Canada, and those principles are are actively promoted. They're they're the bare precondition to you practicing law, to becoming a licensee, and, and across the board. So, the integrity, uh, promotion of the the rule of law, and the administration of justice, those are politicized objectives as well. And when you say you didn't have to swear fealty to the crown, yeah. you because you're indigenous, or you because anybody doesn't have to? Uh, now nobody has to. Uh, most people still do, uh, but I think it was several years before I was called to the bar, uh, one uh, Mohawk lawyer refused to, uh, prospective lawyer, refused to do it, and there was a bit of a, a controversy around it, and thereafter, uh, within a few years, uh, they now tell licensees that, that they needn't swear. Mm -hmm. but, but you are distinguishing yourself from your colleagues who are swearing, uh, making that oath. Moyla, do you have a sense of... Uh quote unquote, racialized lawyers and whether the majority supports these efforts or doesn't? Uh, I don't know that I do have a sense specifically. I mean, I can't speak to any specific numbers, but I, I can say that um, there have been a number of different organizations uh, that inherently actually represent racialized lawyers that have come on board and have said, this is important. We support the initiative that uh, the Law Society is, uh, is moving forward. Uh, and I think it's important, as Julian has said, is that this is one of many parts of this initiative. So while I appreciate what's been said uh, here about whether or not there's the meat on the bones, the reality is, is that if we can't at least at, the, at a very basic level appreciate that there are certain principles as lawyers that we need to uphold, how do we get to the point in time that we can start to look at how we move from principle to action? And because, if I may, I can add to, I can give you the numbers. On the issue of the statement of principles, we've heard from 18 organizations. In the short time this debate erupted, we heard from many, 20 to 30 organizations during the time we collected data. When you say organizations, do you mean firms, law firms? Organizations representing lawyers. We heard from law firms as well, but organizations representing lawyers. It could yes. be Criminal Lawyers Association, Ontario Bar Association, National Women in the Law. We heard from, black I'm lawyers. about to say, we also, and I just wanted to be clear, we heard from lawyers that you would call representing <clears throat> stakeholders, particularly racialized licensees, such as Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, such as Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers. I would like to tell you something very interesting. Of the 18 organizations we've heard from in this latest round of debates, not one is opposed to the Statement of Principles. Not one wrote a letter saying that the Statement of Principles was wrong. In fact, all 18 organizations, including McGill, University of Ottawa, 
All 18 organizations have supported it. We have heard from individuals who have expressions of concern, and I don't want to minimize that mm -hmm. because I think it's important to take into account the role of dissent in society. Okay, with, with, yep. with time running out here, I mean, does, do you find that moving, the fact that all 18, no dissenters among them? I don't think anyone that's expressed opposition in um, the uh, public news sprint or even in opposition has even said that the principles that form the content of the statement of principles are disagreeable. I, you'll find that they say, no, we don't disagree with not being racist. Um, the issue really is whether or not the law society can force your hand. And, and everybody and in Ontario thinks they're a good driver and a fair person. So everybody <laughs> in Ontario doesn't want to be told to be a good driver or a fair person. Mean, but when it comes to dialoguing about race, yeah. it's a difficult discussion. And what we're trying to do, it's not just to direct people's minds to the issues, but it's to send a signal to racialized licensees that we actually hear them and yes. that when we make this pledge about our conduct, not our beliefs, about our conduct, it is sending a signal to them that we're ready to change. Catherine. I think it's more important that we send a signal to the public and to our clients and the, and the communities that we serve, because we're all tremendously privileged as lawyers, racialized or That's not, right. vulnerable yes. or not. So what's more important and what's more at the core of the Law Society's mandate and our obligations as a profession is service to our clients and to the public and ensuring that that is non-discriminatory. Quite right. And, and, and that's one of the things that I said at the very beginning, and that's important. We are privileged. I, I think that it's very important to understand that as lawyers, we're privileged to hold the role that we do in society. And with that comes obligations to society. As a self-governing profession, there are obligations we have to society. So as Catherine said, it's more than just uh, looking in towards ourselves and what we are doing uh, as a profession and as lawyers. It's also how we are perceived uh, in society as well. And, and this is a first and very small step in that, but we have a long way so, to go. I have a question. So mm -hmm. we want to be missionaries of diversity no. and inclusion. It's not about politics. That's, it's that's about what we're rights. trying to be. It's well, about human rights, not politics. I, I want to emphasize this. It isn't about uh, taking a political position. Systemic racism and our ability to address it is about human rights. I think that word political and politically correct forgets that. Human mm -hmm. rights are felt by those who suffer the violations. And I have a trouble with the word politics because it ignores the genuine discrimination that they're feeling and calls it something else. Well, let me follow up with something else. Once upon a time in this capital city in Ontario, if you were Jewish and you wanted to practice law, good luck getting a job at one of the big firms. Right. So what did the Jewish community do? They set up their own firms. And now, I think it's fair to say, Jews are probably disproportionately represented as a percentage of the population compared to as a percentage of lawyers uh, in the province. Uh, it, a, a naive question, perhaps, but why shouldn't racialized communities do the same thing? Well, I want to emphasize, it, it, number one, it definitely is happening. But And speaking as both a Jew and the son of a black Jamaican, I suppose I can cover both bases. Not it's happening, but it shouldn't have to happen. What, what the Jewish communities had to do is wrong. If they're entitled to do it, they should do it. My, my brothers and sisters in the black communities, in any community, should be free to be together or in diverse populations. They shouldn't have to do it. What you just described, historically, is what they had to do. Mm -hmm. I think we have to attack that. I think we have to dialogue about race without being afraid to dialogue about race. Yeah, I don't think we should be getting into sort of the, the Plessy-Ferguson separate but equal sort of a scenario right. because essentially that's what we're talking about when Supreme we're looking at that, right? Yes, yeah. right? And, and we know that um, that was shown, you know, uh, to, to not be the reality of what the circumstances are. And I think that that's important is that Let's not get caught up in that. And I think we, what's happening is that we have people that are talking about consciousness objection and talking about being forced to, to give a statement. And, and ultimately, that's not what this is about. This is about recognizing that as lawyers, we have certain obligations. And these are obligations that we already have as part of our rules of professional mm -hmm. conduct. So this isn't something that is, is new. We have an obligation of, as lawyers to uphold the laws of the land. And part of those laws include the Human Rights Code. Part of those laws include uh, the, uh, the Section 15 uh, guarantees around equality. So this is just a statement that helps us to remember that we have that obligation. Well, and one of the obligations, I got to jump in. Forgive me, I got to jump in because one of my obligations is to make sure that we don't go over mm -hmm. and our time is done. I want to thank everybody for participating in this discussion. We have really, I think, set the table and given people a much better sense about uh, this whole debate. I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thanks for coming into TVO tonight Pleasure. and helping us out with this. Thank, thank you. you for thank having you. Me. Yeah. 
Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.